welcome to episode 116 of Volunteer for Israel's education program in conjunction with Julia, our Israeli wizard, who's online. Just a couple of announcements for this episode. Uh, there is uh, evidence that Israel is letting groups in. There are two known groups that will be going over under Sarel's aegis. One of them is a French group of adults. They'll be the first. And we believe second will be a group that our Johnny from North Carolina has assembled. And we're thinking they may be over there on December 1st or thereabouts. Uh, beyond that is tremendous uncertainty and variability. And in order to, for Johnny to pull off this event and get all the paperwork and things together, uh, as uh, Alana mentioned, it's, it's really complicated. Anyhow, he's, he's judiciously pursuing it. Uh, it is now um, 9 p.m. in Israel, the Laila Tov. It is uh, around three o'clock in the morning in Tokyo, uh, Kenichiwa. And for those from perhaps uh, Europe, it's around, uh, I don't know, eight o'clock at night or so. So we have a whole bunch of continents represented here today. And at this point, I'd like to see if uh, Lana has any comment and then Julia. Go ahead, Alana. Um, just so I just wanted to say, if you're new to this program, I know we have a few new faces. If you don't know about Volunteers for Israel, we're the only um, nonprofit organization that facilitates civilians volunteering on Israeli Defense Force bases in Israel um, based on need. And while we're on hiatus right now, which is why we're having all of these programs, um, as Steve said, we hope to start back up soon, but we're waiting for the um, bases to open. So if you have an interest in volunteering on bases with soldiers to help the IDF, um, I will put my email address in the chat and be happy to talk to you. Great. Julia? Manishma. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome all. Uh, thank you again for coming for the 116 episode and welcome all the newcomers. And I would like to welcome so much and introduce uh, Shua Kisilevich. She's right here with us. She's an archaeologist. She's a graduate of Hebrew University. She uh, was uh, among those who found this amazing find she is going to talk to us about in uh, Mosa. I will say no more because I don't want to make any mistakes. And uh, she is, uh, am I right? You are in charge of this amazing excavations, which you initiated to understand better the amazing finds of the first temple period in Termosa. So I've already listened to Shua once and I really felt like I, I need to listen to her again. And so here we are. Thank you so much for your cooperation. And just before I mute myself and it's all yours, Shua, I want to uh, mention the next presentation we have next week, Thursday, we will have a presentation about ancient forgotten synagogues, maybe not forgotten, but totally off the beaten truck. We already talked about the special synagogues which are active and functioning. Next week, I would like to take you to a few synagogues which I'm pretty sure you never saw before. And yet each of them is different, amazing, special and has a special story to it. So the ancient and off the beaten truck synagogues are coming next Thursday. Looking forward to seeing you there. And thank you all. Shua, it's all yours. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to um, share my screen, make sure that um, that works. So, just a moment. Let's see. Um, and please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, excellent. So, very thank good. you very much. And um, I have to say, this is very, uh, I, it, kind of funny for me because today I was um, driving with my mother in Jerusalem and we saw a Sarel bus. And my mother said, well, you know, my, you know, your great aunt and uncle, Shelly and Eddie used to come on Sarel all the time. And I said, you know, this is very funny because guess what I'm doing tonight? So I think things just happen the way they should. So you were talking about coming to Israel and um, I hope I can transport you to Israel a little bit today, um, talking about um, uh, Moza and the finds at Moza. So this is a very long title that I gave, maybe a little too long, um, but what I'm going to do today is talk about these finds from Mota and particularly the temple, temples, I should say, that we found there. So um, I know I only have an hour, and since I can speak about Mota for days, I'm going to try to be as, as short as I can, 
Um, but I, I would really love to um, then have, if you have any questions, to talk about it and, and continue on. So the site of Mota is located um, northwest of Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem. Um, and every, everything I'm talking about today is BCE. So we're talking about the first temple period, which is uh, um, archaeologically we call it the Iron Age, uh, the first half of the first millennium BCE. Um, so when I talk about Jerusalem, I'm talking about ancient Jerusalem, which is now what we call the city of David um, in the old, uh, next to the old, in the old city area. So Mota is located on the bottom third of a slope that slopes down to the south. So um, I hope you can see my cursor here. Um, so it's on the bottom uh, third of the slope. It's in a very interesting and um, important location because this area is actually um, an area in which we have a convergence of two valleys. Um, we call them streams or, or rivers in Israel, but these are not areas that have running water year round, just in the winter. Um, and it created this very wide basin to call the Moza Basin. And you can see at the bottom left, there is a, a photograph. This was actually taken in the summer. And if you know Israel, you know the summer is not an especially green time in Israel, but this area, really this valley was, is, has always been very nice and green and very fruitful. Um, it's abundant in, in uh, fertile soil. So it's always been an agricultural area. And in fact, excavations that were done in this basin, so this nice photo on the bottom left, um, this area does not look this way anymore because this is now a construction site for a new highway into Jerusalem, Highway 16. But excavations that had been um, carried out there in the last few years revealed that this area had been settled since Neolithic times. So for thousands of years, this area had been settled. And in fact, what they discovered is the largest city, and you can really call it a city from this period in the, um, in the Middle East, probably, definitely in, in the Southern Levant, with evidence of crop cultivation. So especially pulses, um, they found the actual, um, the actual uh, um, remains of these pulses, but also storage facilities, silos and, um, and buildings. So we know that for thousands of years, this area was an agricultural area. And you'll see towards the end of my talk why I'm stressing this, this issue. The other thing is that if you look at the top photo, you can see these little blue clouds, which I created. And those are actually um, depictions of springs in the area. So they really envelop the site. And there are at least four springs that we know that up until the 20th century um, would, would flow year round. And again, this is very unusual for Israel, especially the Central Hill region. There is not a lot of available water. And this area does have this available water. And then lastly, if you look at that dotted yellow line that I, um, that I uh, sketched on the upper photo, that is the ancient route, the ancient road that leads from the lowlands, so from the coastal area and from the, um, the lower Shvila um, and Judaic plains into the Central Hill Valley and to Jerusalem. And this ancient road literally goes right underneath the site. So anyone sitting at the site is really dominating that road. So this is strategically and log logistically a very important area. And this is why the site is there. So we can assume that for thousands of years, there's always been settlement and we find different settlements. It's interesting to see how the settlement moves, but it's always within this, this region of the basin, sometimes in the valley, sometimes on the mountain slope, etc. So in the um, 1990s, excavation started at the till. And the reason they started is because the roads authority wanted to pave a new road on the slope. Um, if you all, anyone who's been to Jerusalem up until uh, six or seven years ago, you know that the road to Jerusalem used to go down right before you got to Jerusalem. You'd go down a road, it would go around this very dangerous curve, which is the Moza curve, and then up into the city. And that was a, that curve got the, the nickname the death curve. It was such a, a scary one. And so they wanted to eliminate that curve. But because it was clear that there was a lot of archaeology, before they started building that road, there were excavations. So they started in 1993, and then there were three more seasons, four more seasons, in the early 2000s and in 2012 and 2013. And these were salvage excavations carried out by the Israel Antiquities Authority, and I was part of the 2012 and 2013 excavations. Um, and that is when the site was really revealed as a major site from the Iron Age, the First Temple period. So there are different periods at the site, but 
the most dominant period is the first temple period. Um, so from the 10th century BCE until the destruction in 586 BCE, that is the destruction of Jerusalem um, and the demise of Judah, the kingdom of Judah. Um, the excavations, as you'll see in a moment, were not, we didn't finish excavating in 2013. We simply finished the salvage part and then the, the construction started, which is why for years I was just waiting to go back to the site. And the moment we could, um, we did. But at this point, this was no longer a salvage excavation because the road had already been built. Um, and so we established um, in 2019, the Moza Expedition Project on behalf of Tel Aviv University, um, directed by myself and Professor Oder Lifshitz, who is also my advisor. I'm finishing up my PhD, um, which is based on the site. And so we're working together. So what are the finds at the site from this period? Well, the most notable uh, finds were dozens and dozens of silos. You can see on the left, these silos, these are actually pits that you cut into, you dig into the ground and then um, line them with small stones and they were used for the storage of grain. We don't know what the top looked like, but we can assume that it was built out of um, some kind of an organic matter that was not preserved because they were definitely closed up. Um, and if you, if you think about silos nowadays, uh, different farms, and you can see it very well when you drive around the United States, you see these huge silos made out of metal, these constructions that are above ground. But in ancient times, silos were actually mostly um, underground. So they were dug into the, the ground. But what we also see at Moza are at least two very large storage buildings in which there are hundreds of these storage jars called whole mouth jars that were used to hold grain. So really what we see is that this is a economic site in which people, this is not a domestic site. This is not a site where people live. It was a site where they stored their grain. So it was really, you know, I call it the Fort Knox. It was their Fort Knox of the people who lived in the region. The site itself is mentioned in the biblical text. It's only mentioned once. And it's mentioned in the book of Joshua as a site that is part of the territory of the tribe of Benjamin. So there's really not very much we know about it, but the excavations, um, I think, have pretty much proved that this is the identification of the site. Because of these excavations, the site got the nickname Jerusalem's Granary, because the assumption is that this site was part of the administrative system and economic system of the kingdom of Judah. From the moment the kingdom of Judah exists, this site is part of it because it is so close to it. In the western part of the site, excavation revealed a very large building. And this is, as you can see, an aerial photo taken at the end of the 2012 season. We can no longer take the aerial photo properly because now there's a road right above it. So it's just a few meters above. Uh, but we have new technology that will allow us to uh, create a composite uh, photo, which is uh, an aerial one. And I'll show you um, in a moment. So here's what we have. We have the temple building, um, which is dated to the end of the 10th century or early 9th century BC at the very latest. So if we want to be on the safe side, I would say the building was constructed in the early 9th century BC. Um, so this is the aerial photo and the special finds that came out of this building are on the left, you can see this blue, um, Egyptian blue scepter head. So it's a very intricate piece that is made out of this special composite, which we call Egyptian blue. And this is a very small item because it is all of eight and a half centimeters. I, I don't know the conversion into inches, but this is, it's pretty small. Someone put a lot of effort into creating this and you can see that the top is a pomegranate. And then under it, you have these, what we call the pendant petals, it's like a, petals of, of flowers. Um, and then on the top right, you can see a photo of a bunch of cultic artifacts that were found in the courtyard to the east of this building. So these elements were found, the scepter head was found in 1993 when the building had just started to, to been um, revealed, but it was not identified as a temple yet. But in 2012, we found these cultic artifacts and it was clear that we are talking about a religious building and so we dismantled all the later periods and we got, we got to the point you can see here now where we can actually see the building um, itself. So this is a, a drawing of, so what we do in archaeology is we draw every stone, we create a plan. So this is the plan of the building. The reason I think this is better than the aerial photo is in the aerial photo, we had already removed some of the elements that are part of this building. 
Um, and here I can show you everything that was found that is part of this building. So the way this complex is, um, is organized is it is oriented to the east, east-west. So north is up, and in the east there is a courtyard with different installations I will talk about in a moment. But then the building itself, the temple, is quite a large building on the western part of this uh, complex. Um, and I want to just kind of say, this is a side note for a moment. I will talk, mostly you'll hear me saying cultic and not religious. And this is not cult the way we think about in the modern sense of it. Um, in archeology, span when we excavate, we can only find material remains. If, if I would ask any one of you now to define what religion is, I'm guessing I'd get you know, about as many answers as people who are sitting here right now, but I think that the, maybe the common denominator would be that religion is a set of belief systems. And the problem with that is that in archeology, span I cannot see a belief system. If I excavate a site, I don't know what the belief system of people was unless they wrote it down. And in this period, there's very little bit of writing. What I do see is the outcome of the actual physical rituals and activities that people did in order to facilitate this religious belief. And that is what we call cult. So when I talk about cultic, I'm talking about anything that is um, in some way the physical manifestation of carrying out your religious um, beliefs. So this is the, the cultic, as I said, the cultic um, area. And the building itself, as I said, is oriented east to west. Um, the, it's a long room, which means that the entrance is situated in the eastern wall. It's quite a wide entrance. It's 1.7 meters wide. And then there are projecting antas. So the edges of the walls project um, to the east. And flanking the entrance are two column bases made of stone, which means that there were columns above, probably um, wooden, maybe cedar um, that were above. And then as you enter the building itself, it's a very massive building. The wall, the northern wall, uh, measures two to three meters wide. And, and it's a retaining wall because this building is built on the slope. So this is to make sure that, you know, wash coming down from the north doesn't destroy the building. Inside the building, there were benches that lined the wall. So you can see them over here. And this was for the sake of depositing offerings in the building itself. And in the Western part of the building, there is another room that projects to the North of the main hall. So this, we think that this is probably just a single room, but it could have been part of a series of rooms that maybe um, enveloped the building to the West and to the South as well. Now, one of the biggest problems with this site is that if you look at this dotted line that I have here on the bottom left, this is the, um, the orientation of the modern day slope. What happened is over centuries, the slope contracted inwards and there's a lot of wash and erosion and also robbing out of the stones of this building because the stones were so nice in, in later periods throughout the centuries, people kept on using them to build their houses. So we have a lot of disruption in the building itself and we're hoping we can find the Southwestern corner, but we're not sure that is, that's gonna happen. So this temple, um, the plan of this temple is actually one we know very well. And here you can see an isometric reconstruction done by Oi Albag, who's working with us. Um, and what this is, this is actually a, a temple plan that is the most common temple plan in the ancient Near East. So we can equate it to the Basilica for churches, right? If, if, if I were to take you now and transport you into a church in the middle of Europe and not tell you where you are, you know, and you just look around and you'd see the, the basilica style, right, the outline, you'd see the different elements that are there, you'd see the podium, you'd see the cross, you'd know you're, you're standing in a church. And the same is true for the ancient Near East. Anyone who saw this type of a building in which we have the, um, these protruding anta and the two column base, columns, um, and then you enter a long room, knew that this was a temple. So this was really the, the most... Uh, it's a um, dominant and, and, uh, and used plan for temples for millennia. It starts in, in Israel. It's already, we know it from the third millennium BCE. So this has been around for, for over a thousand years by the time um, they built the Mozart temple. Now, we always try to find contemporary um, examples that we can, you know, analogous examples. And this type was first found in North Syria, which is why it's called the North Syrian temple plan. 
Um, and the two, I'd say, probably most well-known temples are the one in Teltainat and in Ain Dara, both culturally in northern Syria, although Teltainat is physically located in the south of Turkey nowadays. And you can see this long room um, in both of them. So we have the long room, and then we have the protruding anta, and then the two column bases, and then you go inside and there's a, a definition of different um, areas within the temple. And by far the most important part is the inner space. So at the very, um, in this case, the Western edge or the inner area, there's always gonna be a podium or some kind of a niche. And that is where the representation of the God of the deity would be placed. Because the temple at the end of the day, is the house of the god. It is there to house the god. And in the ancient Near East, gods were very physical, very physical. I mean, they weren't, you know, they weren't in the in the, you know, just around us as a as a general presence and, and in the heavens. They actually were physical beings and you created a house for them and you fed them and you brought them offerings and gifts and you had to make sure that they were happy so that they would keep on making sure that you would be um, healthy and prosperous. Um, and, and that the society would do well. So these two are examples from Northern Syria, but the question is, what do we have in Israel? And the truth is not much because there's been only one temple, apart from the temple at Mozart, only one temple has ever been found during this period in the modern land of Israel. And that is the temple at Arad, which you see here in the top left. And the temple in Arad is a very different plan. It is not this monumental plan of the North Syrian temple. It is actually a much smaller building, and the temple itself is only the western part, so it's actually a broad room with a niche over here, and then a courtyard um, with an altar. Um, so the reason this is a very different kind of temple is because Arad was a southern border town of Judah, and it had a, a fort with a garrison, and so this temple was meant to uh, be there for the garrison, so this is not a monumental temple. The only other monumental temple that we know of in this region is Solomon's temple, the temple in Jerusalem. And this temple is built exactly according to this North Syrian plan. So in fact, if you look at the biblical texts that describe in detail um, the, the plan of this, of this temple and the building of the temple, it is very clear, it says explicitly that both the architects and the builders and the materials are coming from Northern Syria. They're coming from Phoenicia. And you can see here again, the, the reconstruction with the two protruding anta, um, with the Holy of Holies in the Western part, and the two columns that have actual names. This is the Boaz and Yachin mentioned in the biblical text. The biggest problem with this temple is it does not exist archeologically. We know it from the biblical text. We don't know it from any other text or from archeology. span um, We can't dig on the Temple Mount, even if we could, I don't think there's anything left by now. And this is why Mozart becomes so imperative because it's the same type of temple from the same period located less, less than seven kilometers away and we can actually excavate it. So we can use Mozart as a framework for understanding cult and religion in this period and what Solomon's temple, what the temple in Jerusalem would have been like and used for. Now, the biggest problem is that of course, in the ancient Near East, we were not allowed, local, you know, the commoners were not allowed in the temple. The temple was for the God, and it was only the high priest who could enter the temple. Um, so what did, you know, if, if, what did people do? How could they actually um, communicate with the gods? Well, the activities took place in the courtyard. So this is where most, the, the, um, the focal point would have been sacrifices. So animal sacrifices to the God or the gods. Um, and bringing different kinds of, um, of offerings um, and having um, different kinds of rituals. And this would all take place in the courtyard, which is why the courtyard is where we would expect to find the most change and artifacts. And indeed, this is exactly the case. So if we look at Moza, what we have in the courtyard, so this is the courtyard is to the east of the, the temple building. And right across from the entrance, we have the altar, which is built out of stone. We don't have the upper part of the altar that was dismantled, um, but we do have the lower part of the altar built out of stone. Next to it, there is a pit. And in the pit, um, we found an abundance of ash and bones. And these bones had cut marks on them and some of them were burnt. Um, and a preliminary analysis of the bones shows that they were all, or most of them were cattle 
and sheep, um, uh, sheep and goats, I should say. So this is not actually very unusual because in fact, this is what we would expect to find everywhere in the ancient Near East. Um, sacrifices were usually cattle and sheep and goats. So this is, so it, it works really well. And to the north of this pit, there was an offering table. And right at the base of the offering table is where we found all of the cultic artifacts. So the cultic artifacts were found in a very um, delineated area. They were actually placed there. And what happens is, if you think about the way a temple works is, you know, you go, for instance, Steve, who's sitting here, would go to the temple and either once a day if he's very devout or once a week if he's not as devout or once a month if he's not making his mother happy. But the, you'd go to the temple and every time you go to the temple, you bring an offering because, you know, well, obviously Jews, you never show up empty handed when you go to somebody's house, but you're definitely not going to show up empty handed when you're going to ask your God for something. So you're always going to bring some kind of an offering and the offering can be a special artifact, but most of the time it would be food or some kind of oil or, or something um, to that extent. So for instance, if I were to go to the temple and take a bowl with dates with me, and the dates would be the offering, the moment I take that into the temple, the bowl itself is imbued with sacred meaning because it is now used in the cultic rituals. So I can't take the bowl with me when I leave. I have to leave it there. Now imagine that over time, people keep on coming to the temple and they keep on leaving artifacts there. The artifacts are then placed inside the temple on the benches, but every now and then you simply have to you know, clean up. The, the priest would have to collect everything and clean it up so that there would be room for the new artifacts. And what they would do is they would collect it and break it so that you can no longer use it and then deposit it as very similar to what we know as the gniza nowadays. It's the same concept of not removing anything that's sacred outside of the cultic area, the religious area. And this is what we see with these cultic artifacts. So they were all collected and put in one place and broken and then covered up. Um, and a new floor was put um, in the courtyard and new altar, et cetera. And they continued um, using the temple. What we have in these artifacts, there's, there are a lot of vessels and I won't talk about all of them. I'll only mention the unique ones. So on the top, you can see um, different angles of two anthropomorphic, that is human-like um, heads of figurines probably. So you can see the three on the left are the first one and three on the right are the second one. Um, and um, I, I, I think they're very cute. I, they always make me laugh, especially the left one. And I have to, to say that one of them, um, a few years ago, uh, this was in the media. And I, I look at the talkbacks and I probably shouldn't, and then someone said, oh, this looks like Trump. I said, okay, now, now I'm done. I'm done. I don't need to have a connotation of looking at one of them and thinking of someone specific, unless someone says it looks like Brad Pitt, then I'm happy. Um, so we have these two. And if you look at them, look at the bulging uh, nose, this really prominent one, and also the eyes. And they were created as a, as a little, uh, you know, uh, a round ball that was um, adhered and then punctured to simulate the, um, the pupil. Um, they also, by the way, the, also their nostrils were, were punctured. It was very important, I guess, for the person creating them to have the nostrils. And if you look at both of them, if you look at the, the back, you can see that they have hair strands and the hair, every strand ends in a nice little curl. Um, the guy on the right, most of his hair strands have broken off, but you can still see some of them. Um, and the one on the right also has this puncturing on the chin, which simulates the beard. So it is very clear this is a male figure. It doesn't mean that the one on the left is not male. It just means that we don't have this puncturing. Looking at the whole area, uh, both geographically and chronologically, I tried to find the, the best parallels. And the truth is that there are not a lot of figurines during this period. There are actually very few. Um, and so I think that the best parallel is the one that I brought here from Ashdod, which is from the 11th century BC. This is Philistia. And I think that um, it's very similar in the uh, scale of the face and also the, this headdress they, they all have, which is this round headdress with raised edges, um, including, by the way, the puncturing on the chin of the one from Ashdod, which also simulates a beard. But then you can see that throughout the region, even though there are not a lot of um, examples, there are technological similarities. And also, um, I think that especially if you look at the ones from um, Transjordan, Moab, and Adom, they're very similar to ours. 
Um, the, well, the one from Tel Kinrot, which is the Kingdom of Israel, also very similar. The one from Kirbet Kayafa, which is actually geographically the closest to us, not as similar, much larger and different scale. But so there are some, there aren't a lot, but there are some figurines. What is unique at Mota is that we have two of them together and that they're found in a very clear cultic uh, context in a temple itself. We don't have a lot of figurines. We do have figures during this period and they are always on cultic artifacts. So stands or clay altars or model shrines um, found throughout the region all have these human faces and we can, we can see a lot of the same techniques as we see at Mutza. The other type of figurine that we found are animal figurines. So we have this figurine, which is quite small, and you can see the scale here, this is in centimeters. Um, so it's a small solid figurine. And even though I, I admit that when I saw it, um, I initially thought this is a dog, to me it looked like a dog, um, I now realize this is a horse. And the reason is, if you look at the side of the eyes, you can see that they have, um, this figurine has blinkers or blinders, you know, this um, on the sides of the eyes. And this is something you only have for animals, pack animals. So it would either be a mule or a donkey or a horse. And for reasons of um, uh, different analogies, this is probably a horse. It also has the remains of a pack or maybe a rider on it here, right next to on the on the back. Now, whereas this one is not so clear as a horse, the second figurine, and you see different angles here, is very clearly a horse. I think that any one of you looking at it would say, yes, this is this is a horse. It's much larger um, and it has a lot more detail and it has the trappings on the, on the head um, and, um, and the reins that were actually uh, mostly broken off. They were created as, as very delicate strands of clay that were attached. Um, but what is fascinating, I think, about this figurine is that we have the remains of the actual rider that was on it. So if you look at the different angles, especially the bottom left photo, you can see the feet the feet of the rider that was sitting on and they actually created, they, they etched and they incised the toes. So we can see the toes. So the feet of the rider are there. And then we can also see the beginning of the leg going upwards. So this is definitely a horse with a rider. I think it's very interesting. If you look at the position of the feet, it is not the place we would expect to see the feet of a rider that is sitting on a horse. It's too high up. Um, the figure doesn't seem to be standing on the horse, but it's not exactly sitting on the horse. So I admit I'm not sure what the position was. The closest position I can think about was is the jockey position. If you think about a jockey, um, where the feet are very high up on the side of the, the back. But I, I don't know whether there were jockeys during this period. Um, but it is interesting, and we definitely have this horse with the rider. Now, there are not very many of these um, horses in this period. Slightly later on, we start to get a lot of them. Um, when we look at the, it's what's going on in, in Judah, um, in Jerusalem, um, the top right, you can see one of the very few um, examples that we have. And I think it's really hard to see what you're looking at. So I'm gonna point it out. We're looking at the profile over here and what we can see is the neck. And then um, here's the head and the broken uh, ears over here. So it's very schematic. It, it's so general. It would be hard to know what you're looking at if you didn't know. It is nothing like the, the horse from Moza. On the other hand, if we go up to the north, so further north in the kingdom of Israel, we do see parallels. So it seems like this, the influence is coming from the north. And what is very important to point out is that all of the artifacts that were found at Moza were locally made. They're made out of local clay. So someone made them locally. They knew what kind of artifacts they're supposed to create. They knew how they're supposed to look. And they're, they're getting influences from different places, but they're creating them locally. The last artifact I want to point out is this very large cult stand. Now, unlike the figurines, there were probably offerings brought in by the worshipers. This is most likely part of the actual furnishing of the temple. So this was there as part of, um, of what you would see or semi-permanent furniture. And what we have are different pieces that we can piece together, not physically, but here you have, I, I kind of tried to put all the photos together and you can see the, the drawing that actually puts it all together. And it's this very wide base and then a trunk going up with a pendant petal decoration and then a very big bowl with pendant petals on the top. This type of stand is the most common artifact in this period. In fact, from the second millennium BCE and until 
well and, and until the end of the the first temporal period this is what we find everywhere so in in syria in phoenicia in uh in transjordan um in uh you know in, in philistia um everywhere you go this is the kind of artifact you can find and i just brought some of the examples here and it's always the same with this wide base going up with a trunk that has sometimes it has a pendant petal decoration on it and then this bowl on the top which is sometimes attached and sometimes a bowl that you can slot in such as in the examples from Telamal and from Lachish and from Moza, where you can take the bowl out and then you can put it back into the stand whenever you want to. So this is what we see um, everywhere. And in this case, we're finding it inside the, the temple um, complex itself. What is interesting about the, the artifact from Moza is that it also has on the base, it has a molding. So it's actually a plastic decoration where they created two halves of an animal and they stuck it on the side so if we were looking at it um, uh, from the front it looked like the animals were coming towards us unfortunately the front part of the animals broke off but we can see the back part and i kind of we have the drawing here and i sketched it in red so what we're looking at is the back part of an animal here's the body and then we have the leg going down and a tail curving upwards um, but looking from the front so this is a little harder on the top left photo we have two paws in the front, and those paws are very clearly lion paws, which means that these bodies belong to lions, so a pair of lions. However, one of the artifacts that was found, it was actually fallen into the stand, is this crescent-shaped piece of clay. And when I saw this, I said, wow, this looks like a, a wing. And it suddenly occurred to me that we actually know of an animal that has the body of a lion and wings and here's where I think pretty much it would have been positioned, and that is the Sphinx. So in the Levant, unlike in Egypt, the Sphinx comes from Egypt, um, and in Egypt, the Sphinx does not have wings. But in the Levant, so that is the uh, area of Israel and, and uh, Lebanon and, and Syria, the Sphinx does have wings, and so it is the body of a lion with the wings and then, of course, the, the face of a, a human face. So I think it's very plausible that we have a pair of sphinxes here, but whether these are a pair of lions or sphinxes, it doesn't really matter for the, um, the symbolism because having pairs of lions or sphinxes or both of them is a very well-known religious um, and royal motif in the ancient Near East. And, and here are just some of the examples of very clear religious artifacts, cultic artifacts, in which we see these pairs of so Yavna, which is Philistia, we have the pair of lions over here. And then in Megiddo, which is Israel, it's a pair of sphinxes. And then in Tanakh, which is Israel, we actually have pairs of lions and sphinxes, one above the other in these stands. And the reason we have this is because both of these animals, and even though sphinxes were not real animals, they are mythical animals, but they both are a sign of um, virility and strength. And so they always, symbolized the ruler, the king, and the gods. And in fact, the way to show that a king was very strong in the ancient Near East is to show him um, uh, conquering a lion, right? Or, or subduing a lion. Um, and most of the time when we see, or a lot of the times when we see representations of a god, they are sitting on a throne that is made of lions or standing on the lion. It's very, very common. And if you think about the symbol of Judah, that was a lion. And if you think about the symbol of Jerusalem to this day, it is the lion. And th this is not, of course, the only place in the world where this happens. We still think of the lion as the king of the animals, right? So it is clearly a, an animal that has a lot of symbolism of strength um, and, and power. And that is why we see it in these artifacts. But we see it not only in the artifacts, we see it in the actual temples and palaces. So here are examples of the two temples that have the same plan as the temple in Jerusalem and at Moza, the Teltayana temple and the Indara temple, in which they actually have carvings made out of basalt of pairs of lions and pairs of lions and sphinxes. So in Teltayana, the actual column base is carved out as a pair of lions, which is standing at the entrance to the temple. And in Indara, um, we have these carvings of orthostats, these big blocks that have a, a relief at the entrance of the temple with lions and sphinxes, and they flank the entrance because they're guarding the entrance, they're guarding the God. And if you think about 
what we have in the, the depiction in the biblical text when they talk about the Temple of Solomon, the Holy of Holies is housing the representation of the God, which is the Ark. And what is guarding the Ark are the two cherubs, which is now very, they're very commonly identified as sphinxes. So even in the biblical text, we're talking about sphinxes that are guarding the representation of the gods. So if we now return to Mota, um, we did not finish the excavation. We, we, we identified this temple. We revealed as much as we could. We found these artifacts. We realized this is important, but I remind you, this was all done because of a salvage excavation and we had to stop. And this new road was, be, was built uh, from 2013 until 2018. And in 2018, we had a new reality we were faced with, which is this big bridge above the site um, and a whole lot of sand tons and tons of sand that was placed there as backfill that covered everything up while they were building the bridge. Um, and we started to remove all of this sand. Um, and here you can see a photo taken. This is when excavation started in the valley. And you can see already the nice new road which is built. And if you can see my cursor, the temple is right over here, right un underneath the, um, the, the new road, the bridge. So this is what it looked like when we started removing all this sand. And you can see all this orange is the sand. It's very annoying because it's always there no matter how much we try to clean. On the other hand, it is so identifiable because of this color that it's very clear when this is the modern sand. So we started removing everything. There was um, preliminary uh, conservation that was done on the, on the altar and the wall. So you can see over here, there's this concrete, this gray concrete, this is modern concrete. Um, and also uh, conservation that was done for some of the silos. Um, and then this is when we actually launched the new project in 2019. We started with a very small group. And you can see here, I think this is the first sacrificial uh, ceremony on the altar of Moza for in 3,000 years. And, and I always point out that we're only sacrificing Czechs, not Israelis, on this altar. So you can see we were working with a, um, a group from Charles University in Prague. Um, and uh, as of 2021, we also have a group from um, Osnabrück University in Germany. So these are our two groups that work with us. Um, and so this is, um, we're also supported by the um, Israel Science Foundation and by the Gerda Henkel uh, Foundation in, in Germany. So when we started, it was all about removing the sand. And I can tell you that three out of the five people you're looking at here are professors, including um, here in the front is uh, Professor Oder Lifschitz. So, you know, there, there are no menial jobs. Everyone does uh, their part in removing the sand. And this is our latest uh, season, which we finished. This was August till the beginning of September. So really very recent. Um, and we were excavating with a nice big group. Um, and I know in the beginning of the, the conversation, when you were all talking, you were talking about when people can come to Israel. Um, well, here's a, little, here's a little secret. We actually managed to get groups in um, for, the, for the excavation. So think about that if you want to come. And if you want to come next year, you can come in for our excavation. Um, so this is what we now, this is the way the site looks now. Um, and this is a composite um, uh, photo, which is actually taken from different photos. We use a drone now to put this together. As I said, we can never get this nice aerial photo by just using one uh, camera going up because of the bridge above us. Um, and so here's what we have now. So this is the temple outlined in, in yellow. And to the north of the temple, we now know that there is a field of silos, which is earlier. It, it predates the temple. So this is probably 10th century uh, BCE. The temple was built after the silos. We finally found the western edge, the western wall of the temple. We now know that the, where the temple ends. And we have the complete northern room, including a niche in the western wall. Very unusual. I don't know exactly what that means. Usually, a niche is a place where you place the, um, either the uh, standing stones or statues. But I've never seen one um, in any side room of a temple. It's usually in the Holy of Holies. It would be in the center um, of the temple, not in the side room. So that's a question we need to address. Um, and then if we move out, we have the courtyard. So we now finally have the, fi the full extent of the courtyard. Um, and we have the eastern wall, we think, of uh, the courtyard. And to the south of this, by the way, of the, of the courtyard, we have a big building. Right now, we know that it is from the late period, the late part of the period at the end of the Iron Age. But I'm guessing if we excavate underneath, we're going to find the earlier phases of this building. 
um, in this building, we found a figurine, a horse figurine. Okay, so this is one of the later ones, which is the more schematic kind. So this is um, this is just to show we have figurines from different periods and uh, horses from different periods. It will be interesting to uh, to analyze and see the differences between all of them. I can tell you now that the length of the temple is 23 meters and the width is between 10 to 13 and a half meters, depending on whether you add the northern um, room or not. This the length is um, just a few meters short of the temple in Jerusalem. The width is pretty much the same. So this is actually not a small side temple um, that's just kind of a peripheral temple um, next to Jerusalem. It is one that is almost the same size and the same plan and the same types of, of artifacts um, and the same kind of worship that's going on at the same time for centuries and centuries. And I can tell you that we don't know when the temple ceases to function as a temple, but it seems like it gets at least to the seventh century BCE. So if we're talking about construction of the early ninth century, until at least the seventh century, we're talking about a temple that was around for centuries. And the way I know this is because we see different layers of floors. They keep on raising the floors in the courtyard because these floors are made out of um, out of clay or marl or plaster. And so every now and then you have to um, put another layer of floors in there. And this is you can see the section on the top where I numbered these floors that we can see. I can already tell you that I know that there are more than the four that I had numbered. Um, and we also see in the bottom uh, photo, you can see that this is the latest uh, phase we know. There are already stone steps leading up to the temple, and there's a new altar, which is above, much above this earlier altar that I had showed you before. So different phases, they keep on rebuilding all of the elements that they need in order to carry out the worship. Um, in addition to these layers in the courtyard itself, the, itself, we also see that to the south of the building, they start to create new areas, new functions that are part of the temple. So um, for instance, we can see that there is a building, one of the rooms has um, a lot of um, loom weights, which means that there was a, a, an industry of textile production. Now this is not uncommon, both in texts of temples from this period in Egypt and in Syria and in the biblical text, there, there are clear descriptions that the priests wear special garments that are created in the temple area. Um, and in fact, in the biblical text, and, and we also know that they were creating these tectas for the actual gods, that is for the statues of the gods. So in the biblical text, there's actually a depiction of um, women who are sitting in the temple in Jerusalem, inside the temple and weaving garments for Asherah. So, um, so this is probably what they were doing also in the temple here. They were actually creating textiles for the priests and for the, the gods themselves. Um, and I'm assuming that there were other functions. What this means is that we can see over time that the temple grows and now it has new functions. And they have people who are um, artisans, people who, do, who have different kinds of workshops and they have priests. And I'm guessing there's a hierarchy within the priesthood as well. Um, there are people who are building parts of the temple. There are people who are probably part of the administration of the temple, keeping track of what's coming into the temple and what the temple is producing. And so we can really see what the, the biblical texts talk about this hierarchy that is created around the temple. We can actually start to see archaeologically um, at Moza. Alongside all of this, it is also the economic part of the site that is growing. And we see dozens of silos that are constructed to the east of the temple and these big storage buildings that are constructed. And I think we can talk about a growth that's happening simultaneously. And in fact, it is interacting with each other. The cultic side, that is the religious side, is growing and so is the economic side. Um, and this is very much the point of why I think the temple is there, which I will get to um, in a moment. So this is the temple, but I wanted to point out that this is something we now know for sure. There is actually an earlier temple underneath this big monumental temple. And this earlier temple, we tentatively date to the 10th century BCE. Um, and there are, there are pieces of evidence. So what belongs to this temple is actually, and I think it's a little hard to see, but I'm, um, I'm gonna mark it now with a cursor. There are these big stones, which are stone bases. So there's one over here, there's one over here, you can barely see. There's another one over here, and there's another big one over here. And there are remains of walls between them. These were literally sealed underneath the temple, the big temple floor and underneath the altar. Here's the altar. So they're clearly earlier. And we found on top of the floor that goes with this earlier phase, 
a fragment of a cold stand. So you can see it here. I know it's not very clear um, what it is, but trust me, this is the base of a cold stand. Um, and inside one of the silos that is also sealed underneath a big temple, literally the temple is built on top of it, there was a whole lot of ash and bones, which seems to be part of the sacrificial waste that was thrown in there. Um, so this was these were indications for an earlier temple, but and this was found in 2016, but this season, and I'm now, this has just come out, and I don't know if you saw, but yesterday in Haaretz in English, there was a, a publication, um, and this is a new find. So embedded in the wall of the big monumental temple was a stone with what seems to be a carved relief. Um, I'm, I'm being cautious because there's always a possibility that this is um, just part of a stone that broke off naturally, although it doesn't seem like it is, but we can't exclude that. Um, and if we look at this stone, and this is right after we pulled it out um, and turned it upside down, um, it looks very much like two legs of, of a human figure that are uh, uh, facing um, the same direction. So um, here is the, the stone artifact. Um, and here are examples of what we know. We know this stance of a human which has uh, two feet that are facing the same direction. And this is, a and we know it on stone artifacts, carvings. Um, and we see it in, for instance, here you see from the temple in Aleppo, the temple for the storm god, you see the storm god himself who's uh, standing in that stance. Um, if I tried to put it kind of in its place, it would be somewhere over here. Um, it could be a god. It could be the king. Sometimes we have the king standing next to the god. But these are always cultic artifacts, and they're always part of a temple. Now, the fact that it was embedded in the big monumental temple means it is already in secondary use. It was already broken and then used in the, in the big temple, which means it comes from an earlier phase. And we... You know, so we said, okay, so what would it come from? What temple? Oh, we know there is an earlier temple. And that is why we think that there is this, this is now part of the evidence for an earlier temple. We will have to explore this in further seasons. We need to get down to this layer um, in more of the areas. So now what I want to do in just a few minutes is go through the context of Moza. And really the big question that most people have is, um, how can we fit Moza? How does the existence of this temple fit in to what we know about the period. Because based on the biblical text, there is a temple in Jerusalem from the 10th century BCE, which means that throughout centuries and from the establishment of the temple at Moza, these two temples are actually living simultaneously. They are contemporaneous. So how does this fit in? So in a very um, fast kind of overview, um, we know of two cultic reforms described in the biblical text, done by kings in Judah. One is Hezekiah at the end of the eighth century, which is a very, a generally short description, but the really big one, and here I'm only giving you a snippet out of it, is the one um, done by Josiah in the end of the seventh century BC. So if we assume that Josiah was successful, we're talking about maybe the last 40 years of the first temple period. Um, if we assume that Hezekiah actually created the reforms, we're only talking about the end of the 8th century BCE. So this is after these phases I was showing you of the temple in Moza. But in any case, it is clear that until the end of the 7th century BCE, the time of Josiah, here's what's going on. What these reforms are telling us is what was going on until then. And they talk about different gods that are worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem, Baal and Asherah and the host of heaven, and that there are different places throughout the land in which people are actually worshiping. And this, has, this was established by the kings of Judah and under their authority. So it makes sense, even by the biblical text, that at Moza, definitely in the 10th and 9th century BC, there would be a temple and it would work with Jerusalem because this consolidation of worship in Jerusalem and only one temple, according to the biblical text, at best only happens in the end of the 7th century BC. So most of the period of the first temple, there is no consolidation of, of, uh, of religion. It's, it's done throughout the kingdom, um, and there are many different deities that are being worshipped. And this is, again, this is based on the biblical text. But archaeology also shows us that this is the case. So my favorite example is the Mesha Stella, which is from the 9th century BCE. This was found in, uh, in Jordan, um, and Mesha was the king of Moab, and he's describing his, uh, his successful um, 
um, conquest of different areas. And he says, now Kmosh, Kmosh is his main god, said to me, go take Nebo, which is a city, from Israel. And I took from there the vessels of Yahweh and dragged them before Kmosh. So he's actually naming, he's talking about a temple for the God of Israel, Yahweh, in Nebo in the ninth century BC, which means that there are temples for the God of Yahweh, for the God of Israel, Yahweh, outside of Jerusalem during this period. Another, um, another piece of evidence is from, Lech, from uh, uh, the, uh, the temple, sorry, the uh, palace of Sennacherib in, um, in Inveh, um, in which he has depictions of his conquests. And one of these depictions is the conquest of Lachish, which is one of the main cities of Judah. And in that, we see a procession of soldiers, and you can see here the blow up of the, the drawing, and they're carrying vessels. And if you look at these vessels, these are the stands that we know, including the pendant petals, so they're carrying vessels that they clearly took from a temple to um, the king. Now, usually, by the way, and this is another room in a different room in the same building, we have this procession where they're carrying actual statues of gods. So it seems like at Lachish, in the temple of Lachish, there were no statues of gods, but they were, there were these vessels that they could carry out of there. Um, we have cult remains that indicate that there were cult places in different areas, such as in Lachish, where we have a, an assemblage in an area that may be a, a temple or maybe a, a pit, we don't know, but clearly the assemblage of cultic artifacts is coming from a temple. In Be'er Sheva, there were pieces of a stone altar, a big one that were found. What you see here in the photo is a reconstruction. This is not the way they found it. These pieces were actually embedded in a later 8th century BCE storage building, which means that before the 8th century, there was a temple that had a, an altar. And then, of course, there's a temple in Arad, which, as I pointed out, was the only other temple. Um, and one of the interesting things is that this temple was excavated in the 60s. And pretty early on, um, all of the artifacts were moved to the Israel Museum. And some of you may have seen this reconstruction of the, the Holy of Holies in the Israel Museum for, for literally decades it's been sitting there. And very recently, um, the curator of the Iron Age in the museum realized that there was some residue on two stone altars from the temple. And they checked them. And what they discovered is um, remains of different things that were burned on the altars, like cannabinoids, which come probably from, from Asia, um, and then frankincense, uh, which comes probably from Arabia or Yemen. So we now know what they were burning on these altars. So it's, it becomes very interesting. And this is another indication for how uh, you know, technology is now where sciences are coming into play in archaeology and we can learn new things, even on things that were excavated um, decades ago. So now we come to the, the, I think, some of the final questions, which, which I hope some of you have been asking or wanting to ask about, which is, first of all, who built this site? Um, who built the site and the temple at Moza? So my answer would be um, that these are the local population that we cannot expect that you would have a local population that would not have a place of worship. It does not work now, and it did not work in the ancient Near East. Um, you know, if you think about a Jewish community, if, if Jews start coming to a certain place and there are enough people, then they will create a synagogue. It may be first in the house of somebody, and then they'll build something. If, they're, if they have enough money, then they will build an actual building. But there's always going to be a place you can go and worship. And in the ancient Near East, it is the same. Um, think about some remote society now. If we were to go to, you know, a, an island in the middle of nowhere, if, if there are a group of people there, they are worshiping something or someone, and they are carrying out different rituals. This is just human nature. It's a way of making sense of the world and, and having control of what's going on. So I think this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a community that had a temple because every community should have a temple. But why at Mutza? I think this has to do with the fact that this is an, um, an agricultural area. What we see in Mutza is that initially the site is an economic site. And what happens is that once they start to, the economy starts to grow, they now form a temple, they build a temple there. Why? Because this is, you know, this is again, as I said, this is their Fort Knox. This is where all of their money is being stored. And so they need to make sure that it is going to prosper and that no one is going to rob them or that, uh, you know, the weather will be good enough so their crops are good and that, uh, you know, rodents won't eat up their, their, uh, their crops. Um, and so they start praying, and the way to do this in the ancient Near East is, if you have a, a, an industry, you place the god right smack in the middle of that industry to make sure that he is taking care of that industry, and you keep him happy, or them happy, to make sure that they will keep on ensuring the prosper of this, uh, of this site. 
So I think this is what we're talking about in Mota. It really has to do with the, the region and the economy of the region. So the question also, another question is, what is the relationship between Mota, the people in Mota and the temple in Mota and Jerusalem or the kingdom of Judah? So the, one of the biggest issues in archeology span nowadays is when did Jerusalem become the capital of a kingdom of Judah? And there is no agreement. Biblical texts talk about the 10th century BC. Archaeology right now is talking about maybe the late 9th century or rather the 8th century BC. Now, I don't know, and in this case, I don't think it really matters. What is clear is that at a certain point, Moza is under the rule of Judah and Jerusalem, and the temple continues to function. So whether these people started out as what we would call Judaites or before Judah was established and then they became Judaites is I think not so much, um, is not as interesting as the fact that it is clear that the people in this region have temples and that they are worshiping probably different gods. And this, this goes to who is being worshiped there. So I don't know if this artifact we found with the relief is depicting a storm God, um, but I think that it is very clear that is probably a bunch of different deities. There are different gods that are being worshiped in this period. Um, and Yahweh, by the way, we don't know about him before the ninth century BC. So um, if you think about theophoric names, names that have the element of, uh, of the God in the biblical text, you know, the earliest names, the theophoric um, element is El. El is the head of the pantheon, the Canaanite pantheon. Even the name of our nation, Israel, right? Israel, it's, it's not, um, you know, a, a, a nickname. It's the actual name of the God. And the theophoric components that have Yahweh, Yahoo, only come in later. So at least in the beginning, I think we're talking about different deities. At a certain point, definitely Yahweh comes in and is the main deity, uh, but not the only one, at least not until the late seventh century. So who are these people? I think we can call them the Motsapolity or clan, at some point part of Judah. And just to kind of wrap up, I want to show you what we did at the end of the excavation this season. We covered everything up with this geotextile, which is a special kind of um, textile, um, just to make sure that nothing is ruined and that the, the you know, winter rains don't wash everything away. Um, and um, what I want to do now is, I know you can't come to Israel right now, but this is going to be the closest thing to being able to take a little tour at the site. Um, so I have a, a short video here, and we're going to be flying through um, the site from east to west. So we're starting here um, at the area of the silos and we're going towards the temple complex. So I'm gonna point out once we get into the courtyard. So we're entering the courtyard right now. And this is what the area looks like right now. We're flying over the altar, you can see. Now we're getting to the entrance to the temple, going into the temple. And you'll be able to see that northern room I was talking about and how massive these, these walls really are. So this is now the northwestern corner of the temple. And then we have the isometric reconstruction of the first phase of the temple. And then the later phase where there are slight changes and the addition of rooms to the south. And finally, I think one of the nice things is to see how everything is discovered. And so here is a morning, just a few hours um, in 2021 of how the excavation actually went. So, so all of this is all done by hard work, by people who come in and volunteer by our groups. And I will tell you, we had this year, we had wonderful volunteers and most of the people you see here are local volunteers, all ages. Um, and so if you want to be part of this, we will be very happy. Um, our season next year is in September and we will open up registration through our website and you can learn about new things through our website, telmota.org. Um, and thank you very much.
for your attention. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. It was it was a great presentation. It it actually made it more clear. And I'm really happy that I insisted on having this presentation, first of all, for me and then for all the others. And I really hope that some of us may uh, come and volunteer and help excavating this fascinating site. So thank you so much. Uh, we have quite a few questions here. So yeah. Uh, would you like to look at chat? Would you like me to read it for you? What I think it's easier if you read it out because, yeah, and, and then I'll, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Okay, where is Ilana? We lost Ilana. Okay, never mind. Um, so let me just uh, get back to the beginning. And let's see. Um, okay. Uh, um, okay, so first question would be, can you please explain how you know that an item is cultic? This is an important one. It is an important one, actually very interesting. Um, and so the, 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 I'd say the quick response or the quick answer is that based, some of them we know because it has religious visual uh, imagery. So when we see um, a goddess or a god, and gods usually have very specific elements, they have horned uh, headgear or, or different attributes, the star is next to them. If we see them, um, or if we see two ibexes that are standing on the side of, of a tree, we already know that this is the holy tree, because we have other places where there are texts that coincide with these visual imageries. Um, the, the altars are very clear because they are used to burn something on, and this is something you'd only do for cult. Um, and also the shrine walls are. Um, so then what it's usually when we see something that's unusual, and then we can tie it into a, diff a place where we actually saw it in context, that is how we will determine that it is um, cultic. But it is true that there's a whole you know, a list of criteria we have to follow um, and it used to be a joke in archaeology that when you found something you couldn't explain, you'd say, oh, this is cultic. But now we're very careful not to do it. We only do it. We only talk about something being cultic when we can actually go to some place in the region where it was found in context and talk about that way. Okay. Uh, well, this is a question I guess you sort of explained, but yet, uh, why would there be a secondary temple so near to the primary temple at Jerusalem? Yeah. So I mentioned it, so I won't I won't go into detail. But this is again, this is just it, I think it's it's unhuman to expect that people would not have a place of worship. People don't wait, you know, to to go, you know, once every few months to a temple. Um, the temple in Jerusalem was definitely the king's temple, right? The, so if you think about it, it's like the Westminster Abbey, but you'd still expect you. So you have the main one, which is the royal temple, but you would still have temples in different places, um, which would be functioning for you know daily daily use. Um, mm -hmm. I'll also say something which is uh, we tend to project from the second temple period to the first temple period. Most of what we know, if you would write down what you think about cult in this period or religion, um, we could go through it and I would show you that this is actually second temple period and not first temple. We know almost nothing about the first temple and it was definitely what we would now call pagan. They were not Jews. They were Judaites, they were Israelites. Um, and the way they practice uh, religion was the way most people in the region did. Um, so, you know, becoming the, the Jewish part comes in later and a lot of what we think of nowadays is very much later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, we have another question, which should have been the first one, maybe. Um, anyhow, Diane asks, uh, what is cultic mean? Yeah, so this is what I was saying. The cultic is any, any kind of, um, something that we can say is the result of religious activity. So if, if, uh, if I went to the temple and I sacrificed an animal, I, you know, then nobody in, in 300 years, unless I wrote it down, no one would know what I was chanting, what the, you know, the prayers I was saying were, but they will be able to see the altar. They will be able to see the remains of the, the, the um, animal that I was sacrificing. And that is the cultic, uh, those are the cultic remains. So it is the physical remains. Okay. okay. 
Now, Laura, right, uh, bringing a bowl of figs or some offering like that makes me think of offerings for an idol. Doesn't, uh, doesn't seem very Jewish. It's not Jewish. As, as I said, they were not Jews. They were not Jews. Jewish, you know, even if you think about the biblical text, which underwent you know, so many different editions um, throughout the centuries, Unlike texts that we find in archaeology that were buried at a certain period of time and they are capsule of a time, um, the, the Jew, you know, the, the um, biblical texts were ongoing. Different ideologies, obviously religious ideology, was inserted throughout the periods. And we know that most of this or a lot of this was inserted either at the very end of the first temple period or even after. It obviously depicts things that happened after the exile, right? After the, the conquest of Judah, after the destruction by the Babylonians, etc. Um, so it's an it's an ongoing story, and and having said that, all of these texts were created or turned into a, a canon only in the Hellenistic period, much much later. And we know that they went through different you know uh, stories that they had and different versions of the stories, and they decided what would make it into the biblical in what we call the Bible now. And we know that there were some stories that did not make it in, and some made it in in two different versions. The Book of Jeremiah has two different versions that were inserted so we have to remember that that this does not depict exactly the way things were and the other thing is that if you think about so first of all in the ancient times writing was writing and reading was you know only done by certain people most people did not read and write and it was always done um you know to represent the the leader or the ruler um and it's it's always an agenda but even if we didn't go there you know we live in the age of fake news right if you think about um, today, and you would read different papers, so I can tell you in Israel, if, if I were an archaeologist of, in a few hundred years, and I would go back to the newspapers, and I would read Haaretz, and I would read uh, Israel Today, and I would read Idiot Achonot, I would be getting a very different concept of the same day. And even though they're all describing one reality, they're choosing what they're going to talk about, they're choosing what agenda they're presenting, so now what becomes reality? So this, think about the biblical text that way. It is always serving the person who wrote it. You know, history was written by the winners. And I say the winners were the people in the temple in Jerusalem. They were not the people in the temple in Moza, because guess what? This temple in Moza, which was right in the face of any person coming to Jerusalem from the West for hundreds of years is not mentioned once in the biblical text. They managed to not mention it and get away with it. So okay uh great uh well uh next question is i'm curious what advanced technologies have been used at the site uh ground penetration radar any dna analysis yeah so that, that's a wonderful question we're trying to do whatever we can um ground penetrating radar we thought about doing that but actually it's it's not going to be i think very helpful because in most of the site there are later 20th century walls um above and ground penetrating radar can only see about 30 or 4 centimeters um in to the ground so we won't get what we need but we are trying to use we're using osl which is a way of um dating the last time that soil was exposed to sunlight so mm -hmm. it's a way of dating actual earth which is something that until you know until recent years we couldn't do um we're trying to bring in yes dna definitely in fact yesterday i had a conversation with someone about um, there's a new uh, project that's starting in Germany, and they very much want to do this um, DNA. Um, and this would be not human DNA, because we don't have human remains in the site from this period, but, but animal DNA. Um, we're doing residue analysis to see what was in vessels um, whenever things are preserved, but there's not much pollen analysis to see what kind of um, fruits and vegetation was around or brought into the temple. Um, you know, there, there are different things we're really trying to do whatever we can, and, and um, we're definitely looking for people to do. We're, we're keeping samples of everything, assuming that there will be technologies that we don't even know about now in the future. And because we're digging everything up, we want people to be able to do these uh, analyses in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Harry asked, um, from looking at the stones, how do you determine that it is an uh, offering table? and not anything else altogether. So the, the offering table is the, the um, it's kind of, it's a built stone, it's a few stones, right? And it's built. And the reason I think it's an offering table is first of all, I look at, um, at parallels in other places, mostly to the north of us. 
but also because the artifacts were found right at the base of that, it makes sense to me that they were probably just pushed down. Um, and, and it is true that this is an assumption. In the beginning, I called it in, in my first slide, actually, it's called the podium. But at a certain point, I realized I, I'm going to call it an offering table, but that is definitely a matter of um, interpretation. That's true. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Uh, again, Diane asked uh, why the figurines you've mentioned uh, are called zoomorphic and what were they used for? So um, most of the figurines, again, we don't know very many during the 10th and 9th century BC. From the 8th century on, we see them everywhere, and, and I mean everywhere in the, the East, you know, in the, in the ancient Near East. Judah is full of them. Anywhere you excavate 8th century BC until the end of the, the first temple period, you literally find hundreds of these figurines everywhere. Why most of them are horses? Why horses? It's one of the big mysteries. People talk about maybe the rise of cavalry because of the Assyrian caval um, you know, cavalry during the 9th century BCE, um, perhaps. I, I don't know. Um, I think it starts even before the Assyrians really rise in this region, so I'm not sure. Um, you know, the uh, gods often, including Yahweh in the biblical text, are described as riding chariots or riding um, horses. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's, it's, a, it's a sign of, of power, um, but there's no exact, uh, you know, we, we don't know is the truth. We can speculate, but we don't know exactly. We just know that this is what we see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Well, now we came to Ilana's comment about please consider making a donation. Yes, please consider doing that. Um, okay, let's see. Okay. Um, will the recording of the talk be available? Uh, sure. This is a question that I actually forgot yes. to ask you before. The yes. Yeah, that's, okay, that's great. So the answer is yes. I'm so happy. Thank you so much. So the recording will be available at the usual list of uh, VFI Medicaid's uh, presentation. This is wonderful. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, as some of the figurines showed northern origins, is it possible that Mozza was under the control of the northern kingdom at some point? It's, it's always possible. Um, it's always possible if you ask Finkelstein, he'll probably say, Israel Finkelstein, he'll probably say yes, because, you know, uh, he thinks yeah. that the, you know, it, everything the, this, is about the Northern yeah. Kingdom. Yeah. Exactly. Different people have their own. Uh, I, I think that this is something that is very naturally local because we see it. It's not that someone came in and built this huge temple and a big site. No, we can see it growing very gradually. I think it is a local community. Now, how did they define themselves? I don't know. You know, we talk about the Phoenicians. But the Phoenicians never talked about themselves as Phoenicians. They would have been either from Tyre or from Sidon. You know, I mean, there we tend to try to group people together when actually this is a period. This this begin, you know, 10th century, 9th century is a period where different societies are starting to to grow and and become polities. Um, and it's true that the Kingdom of Israel already exists in the 10th century BC. But I don't I don't think I think it would be a stretch to say that this is under the Kingdom of Israel. Um, and, and there's no indication that there is, but you can't say that, you know, I mean, no one can say one way or the other until we find an inscription that says, hello, I am the king of, uh, the, you know, Israel, and I am now ruling over Moza. You can't say one way or the other. I think it is not very plausible that this is the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the reason question by Deb, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, it says, before worship was burial place for the dead, right? Um, what do you... Deb, if you're still here, what do you mean by before worship? Um, unless sure you you understand the I question. Don't, I don't I'm saying, understand. I'm, I'm saying that I thought, well, I guess I was thinking that the temple was was for Israelites, Hebrews, but don't isn't there usually a burial place for the dead is one of the first things when they set up a village and not a temple? Yes, but this is not the village. This is not the domestic area. So they, for sure, they would have had um, places where they buried next to it. But this is an economic site, which then becomes a cultic one or a religious one. So we won't expect to see burials um, over there. Um, it is true that we, we need to find the actual residential areas around. Uh, we have some from, from this period, but not as early in the period. Someone had to have built a site. Thank you. So, so did we? Did you actually find a residential area? Do you, you actually know where people live? 
I we did not find that from from this uh, from this early part of the period. Yes, definitely from the later part. Um, and it is on the mountain tops, which is interesting. They don't take up. I think it's because they don't want to take up any of the area in the valley, which is the agricultural area. Um, and so their residences, the 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 villages are on the mountain tops. And we know of a few. That, I mean, um, right in the area. Um, now the thing is that excavations are were they're salvage excavations, so they're always very specific and limited and and they don't go all the way down i mean you know we don't know um because it is clear that there was a community that built this temple mm -hmm. and this site and maintained it i'm assuming those residential sites started in this period and actually what they what they would have done is create a, a fortification system like a, a belt around this site uh, because mm -hmm. the site itself does not have fortification so i think it was kind of nestled in the middle of a bunch of of uh of you know villages around Okay, so it's actually, it's, it's not a temple which belonged to a certain community, but rather a temple which was attended and, and used as a place of worship for, for several communities living around it, right? Yes, but I think that these communities pulled together to create this economic site. So yeah. in some way, they saw themselves as, you know, th there was something that connected them. In the beginning was the economy, and then it becomes the religion, you know, the religious aspect. And it's definitely part of this one system, which I'm assuming at some point they were so interconnected that we would have called them the same community, even though they were living, you know, maybe different different villages or different clans, but as the same entity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, that, that's another, uh, we have a short question, which is, uh, you know, it could be a topic for the next presentation, uh, but maybe you can answer just a very brief answer. Uh, will you speak about the 7th uh, century BCE consolidation of temples? Yeah, that, that is definitely a topic on its own, um, it, because it's also, it's archaeological, it's biblical, so, but I can tell you that it is, uh, why, I mean, it's commonly accepted by biblical scholars and archaeologists that the consolidation did not happen before the time of Josiah. And so mm -hmm. at the very best, I mean, if you're being a maximalist, you would say from the time of Josiah on, and as I said, this is less than 40 years, the very end, end, end of the period where you're talking about one place of worship, one God, you know, at best. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did you find any mikvehs, or this is too early? No. This, yeah. This is, as I said, this is, the mikveh is, is already second temple period. It's a. It's that is you're talking about Jews already, and this is this is before that period. Yeah. Okay. We don't have that type of. Uh, we, there are no mikvehs in, in the earlier periods. Okay. Well, I think now we came to praises. Uh, thank you. Outstanding. Great. So interesting. Excellent and so on and so forth. So um, this is wonderful. Uh, okay, the technical question about uh, do you provide housing? Well, I think when, when we get closer and, and we actually uh, have a group, so we will find out about these things. I, I, um, will, I will say that we have, uh, you know, if you come to volunteer, then I mean, there, uh, there, it's a, uh, you need to pay because we don't have the money to put everybody up. But what you get is we have, everything is already organized. Um, uh, we have a place where we stay, a very nice place where, where we stay, and it's all food is included, and we have tours, and we have lectures, and you know everything is built in. Um, so yeah, it's all very organized that way. Well, that sounds amazing. Uh, okay, well, once again, a question about mikveh. You already answered this one. Um, how about pig bones? Did you find any pig bones? Um, this is interesting. So I, I think that there is there are a couple of uh, bones, but I don't know exactly. Um, but this is when I spoke to Lidar Sapirchen, who's one of the archaeologists, uh, you know, the main ones in the in the country. She told me once, because I, I had asked her about this. She said, "Look, there were pigs in this period. There is no no site during this period where you will not find pig bones because there were pigs around and they were eating them. And just I think it was about a couple of months ago. I don't know if you saw this in the in the news." Um, it was, I think, I mean, different uh, papers uh, were, um, had, had uh, noted this and maybe, I'm sure also internationally, that there was actually a pig, a piglet, I should say. It was a small pig found in the city of David excavations, in the Givati parking lot, um, from the eighth cent in, a, in a collapse from the 8th century BCE. And this is a pig that was clearly for consumption in the 8th century BCE. So this is now physical proof 
of the fact that during this period, and I'm, this is why I was saying to you, you know, this concept we have of what they should have been doing and the way they, you know, should have, you know, what religion was, is what we think they should have done. They don't know it, you know. <laughs> if we'd go back and meet someone from Judah in the 8th century BCE, they'd be horrified by what we think they should have been doing. Um, so they were eating pigs. And yeah, there are a few bones, not very many, but uh, there are some. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, it's a rephrasing the same question, but people are really worried about, you know, were they Jews or pagans? Is it a Jewish or a pagan site? Well, here's the thing. Uh, they would, you know, none of the people from the first temple period would make it past the Rabbanut, right? The, the you know, the, the courts, the rabbinical courts nowadays, none of them, they would be thrown out. Um, probably the closest would be the Samaritans. If you've ever been to a Samaritan community and seen their, um, the way they, you know, and there's a reason because they've kind of, they're, they're, uh, frozen, right? What the way they do things is frozen in in uh, the past, later than the period we're talking about, but much earlier than than what Judaism became. Um, we yeah, we would call them pagan, but that is because we have an idea of again what we think being Jewish should be, and as I pointed out, what we think Jewish should be is Second Temple on. It is not the First Temple period at all. And if you read the biblical text again now. And I'm not a biblical scholar. I've learned enough to understand, you know, where I fit in. But if you read the biblical text, um, one of the processes I went through is, you know, I was raised secular in this in, in Israel. But even being raised secular in Israel, you're still indoctrinated in biblical paradigm. And it was uh, certain things were very obvious to me. Um, and when I started to shed that, I realized I was reading the Bible the way I was told that I should be reading and understanding the biblical text. But those interpretations are centuries after the biblical text was already creating into a canon. So we can't use what, um, you know, medieval Jews, uh, you know, the same way they thought about the biblical text and what religion should be. If we really want to do it, let's read the biblical text. And you'll see that the Bible is actually telling us everything. Uh, because one of the wonderful things is that even when they added new agendas to the biblical text, they usually didn't erase things. So the information is still there. Um, and you can see very, very clearly, the biblical text is telling us up until the very end of the period, they're worshiping different gods in the temple in Jerusalem. And that the, the kings of, the, of Judah are the ones who built all these places and were, you know, carrying out this. So, so who are we to say that if they were doing it for centuries, but the last 40 years, things were different than everybody before that was wrong? I mean, it's just the way we perceive things now, you know, I'm, and, and I think that it's actually, to me, it's wonderful. It's seeing the development of the religion. It's, it's seeing how it started and how it became what it is now. But yeah, I think we need to be very careful. These are not the Jews the way we think of Jews now. Okay. Well, this is very, very interesting, very eye-opening, very confusing, um, pretty much Explosive, bothering. I call it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know. really bothering. Uh, were they Jews? Uh, we are Jews. Are they Jews? This is so complicated. But yeah, history and archaeology and, and human beings are complicated. So thank you for pointing it out for us. Uh, as I can see, we ran out of questions on the chat. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any further questions, really, really bothering ones. So uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Otherwise, um, half past 10 p.m. is really time. Um, Shua, thank you so much again. Thank you for taking the time and effort. And this, this is just an amazing presentation, really. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you all of you and the smiling faces around. And Stephanie, you were the, somehow you became like the, the, the face I saw all the time. And thank you for that smile that I could see the whole time. So thank you all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shua, and I hope to join you at your excavation next season. Uh, at least I'm here, you know, like an hour drive, so I will make sure it happens for me. And I will convince the others. Laila Tov, Toda Raba, Shua, Toda Raba. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, one of the top 10, what do you think? Very nice. What happened to Steve? You got a thumbs up from Reba. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'd like Reba. to go on in the one of the excavations. <laughs>